Hey, it's Andrew here from Mortgage HQ, and I got Ryan from One Plan, and uh, he's got his own podcast, and he, he's pretty active in the marketing space. So if you start following any of the TikToks or LinkedIn, you're, you're probably going to see him. Um, welcome, Ryan. How's it going, man? Thank you, Andrew. The uh, the Andrew from Mortgage HQ on YouTube. You guys yeah. kill it there. So. <laughs> yeah, it's it's actually exciting that with uh, the social media platforms and you know, just digital in general that if you're willing to put in the effort on the content side of things and give value, then you can find a platform to share it. And whether that's your dancing, which uh, you're a bit braver <laughs> there than I am, um, or whether it's... <laughs> Misguided. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, the way Ryan and I became connected, um, I did a... A little feature on his podcast and then not too long after he invited me to a marketing mastermind with a bunch of finance guys and i'm definitely learning a lot from from some of those guys um i'm sure you feel the same ryan uh, what's what's uh what have you been doing at one plan how long you've been there and what do you guys do i've uh, been there three years and basically the biggest problem we solve is like you're going to retire at some point and you're not going to have an income you got to work out where it's going to come from so we, we do the big picture thinking for that and solve that problem yeah and it's not a problem that just magically goes away if you if you wish it to yeah hit in the sand if you hit in the sand you still get hit by the waves yeah yeah i like it man it's and those analogies are powerful to just shift the mindset back and unfortunately most people would rather try to figure out what burger they get from mcdonald's instead of um, you know how to how to build the million dollar equity pool that will deliver income for life mm. so what do you how do you feel the current market position is uh, in terms of like the next next three to six months what do you see playing out well it's, it's a very um turbulent time you know it's universally accepted that fortune telling is you know doesn't work except in finance <laughs> That's why I'm asking you instead of doing this <laughs> Smart man, smart man. But I, I can I can talk to the the issues that we're facing, which is you know, global inflation. The latest statistics came out of America is six point eight percent. Yeah. New Zealand inflation is four point nine percent. Arguably, I said six. It's probably higher. Yeah, those results that they give out are pretty delayed. Um, delayed data. And I had some insider information from government officials that they're actually trying to not freak us out, which sounds like the government. So, well, it sounds like manipulation of data to me, but uh, let's not go there. <laughs> but should we go political now? Uh, so that so you got this global inflation issue, but then you've also got supply chain issues. So, like in the US and Europe, um, there's just a huge shortage of supply, um, which drives up prices as well. Yeah. But then the other concern is you've got um, at the moment you've got uh, interest rates that are relatively low to protect businesses that are impacted by COVID. Um, so that means the Reserve Bank here in New Zealand that sort of uh, influenced the cost of money, shall we say, they're actually fearful to increase interest rates because of the impact it might have on businesses. Um, so their mandate, they're meant to keep inflation between 1% and 3%, which they're failing miserably. <laughs> Um, but then the other concern is unemployment is really low in New Zealand and net migration is really low as well. So there's people aren't coming in the country and there's not enough people to hire. So what are you going to do? Pay them more. Um, yeah. I had so a then, situation recently in one of my businesses where trying to bring on someone part time and she was really excited about it. And then she went back and did her numbers and realized she was going to lose a lot of her benefits and that she was essentially going to be working to get the money she was already getting for free. So she just decided why would i why would i bother and i think that is a situation that's pretty hard for the government to get out of i don't see any quick fix uh, quick fixes there so that what does that mean a lot of businesses are going to struggle to find staff unless they're willing to get full-time staff and even then uh, that's still pretty hard to find people yeah it's the biggest overhead so you imagine all these businesses that are planning off low interest rates suddenly there's an increase of interest rates to keep inflation under control the supply chain issue, so accessing the products that they need to deliver the service they provide is impaired. And, you know, obviously you're paying your staff more. And so it, it's, it's, you're doomed if you do, if you're doomed if you don't. So I think the biggest thing in the next three to six months is a very turbulent, volatile time where the, the central banks of the world try and manage inflation as well as manage the impact it'll have on businesses. 
Yeah. So I, I made my prediction is it's going to be like a yo-yo. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people are just holding their breath and waiting to see what happens, and uh, that will cause inactivity. So where a lot of businesses seasonally make make a lot of money around that Christmas, New Year's holiday time, it's not going to happen this year, and it didn't happen last year. So you're, you're looking at quite a big chunk of people's expected revenue and, and where the profit comes from that is not going to arrive. Um, because people are sitting on the couch watching Netflix and getting Uber Eats instead of, you know, getting out there and spending their money. Um, so who knows? Uh, like you said, fortune telling is quite hard. Uh, and the property market and the share market is two different beasts. So uh, you're, you've got more focus on the share side of things, right? We, we, we sort of, we focus on owning a basket of goods, which is shares, property, cash and bonds, because we don't know what's going to perform well and when it's going to perform well. Yeah. So it's really, if we own the market, then the risk to clients isn't losing money. It's just the fact that it'll go up and down and not to freak out. Yeah. Do most uh, KiwiSaver providers, you know, the, the conservative balance growth, they're going to have bonds in those funds? Yeah, usually. Um, the, there is a paradigm shift at the moment. I don't know how in depth you want me to go on it. So oh, feel free cool to rein me in. Well, so there's a potential bond crisis that's similar to 1994, if you want to look it up. But bond, what a bond is, is basically a loan agreement um, with institutional groups like the government, banks, or corporations, usually. And you get a, a return, kind of like you would if you, you know had a mortgage at the bank. There's like a four percent return that you get from loaning your money to these institutional groups. And the second piece is you make money from selling it. And how much they're willing to pay for it depends on the credit rating, different things, but also what everyone else is offering. So what's been happening is bonds have been trending down. So the interest rate you get on the bond is less. But now you're going to try and sell when it's changing direction slightly where it's actually trending up. Um, so then how do you sell something where you're getting 2% but the market's offering four? So then you have what's called a liquidity risk. It's hard to sell what you own and it's hard to get a good price. So there's a number of fund managers either sticking to it and just seeing what happens or other ones trying to be innovative and think around it. Mm. Yeah, a lot of the bigger funds, especially the, the passive ones that try not yeah. to get too involved and get stuck with what they've got and it potentially gets worse and worse each day and there's temptation to try and impact it but your you know your your whole core reason of being for that fund means you're not really allowed to <laughs> so you're watching a <laughs> ship crash from a, a, a from a distance yeah it's tough but, i mean you think a conservative investor a retirement client buys a conservative portfolio which has more bonds and shares and property and it's gone down 12 percent if it's say a passively managed fund and then, you know, there's examples like Simplicity where they just, you know, track the index, which is really good from like a, a growth portfolio because shares do well. But with their um, conservative investment is, is tracking down and they've got longer term bonds. So it's harder to pass that off as well as having a lower interest rate because usually a protection you might have is have shorter term bonds. So the person you're selling to takes less risk. Mm, yeah. So a lot of the people that are not chasing risk they just want like a small steady return and those are the ones again taking advantage of the most at the moment <laughs> yeah stitched up yeah 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 which it's not really fair um but people have to take it upon themselves to switch providers if that's what it takes to get a different allocation method i guess so what do you does that that sort of thing scare you um you know what's going on in the fund market at the moment you were talking a little bit about uh some of the providers doing things that other providers have not yet started doing <laughs> yeah i mean when you have a paradigm shift you have people you know being a little too innovative and you know it's it's hard. the hardest thing at the moment is um, a big core of what we do is tailoring their investment to achieve a certain objective is based on the modern portfolio theory where you you take in their risk tolerance how long they're going to use them until they need the money and you combine those two factors to have a jumble of the four asset classes so shares property cash and bonds um, but now it's a little harder to gear that 
Um, but it's really around how you've set the expectation with your client and we're not making speculative calls on the investment. So we don't freak out as such. It's more just we're fielding more calls from clients and we're just saying, hey, we've got to look at long term. Your personal circumstances haven't changed. It's just you're experiencing more volatility than what we wanted. But the long term scope is not a concern. So I, I don't I don't lose sleep at night. If I was, you know, a speculative share broker promising the world in returns, but we sell on lifestyle, mate. So we're we're okay. The odd client's freaked out, but you know, that's our job. So Yeah. So basically the client pays you annual fee based on funds managed and you help them allocate that money basically. Pretty much, yeah. But it just we get incentivized for their success. We, like sure we do the investment, but it's more just having someone in your field. Um, and has competency in finance that looks at the big picture. Mm. Um, but yeah, basically we, we're kind of like the mechanic and then you go to the, the store in terms of um, uh, to get the car, but we just make sure it's still working and doing what you want it to do. Yeah, to professionals like a mechanic, if I said to them, hey, I'm going to take apart my car and take the engine out there, put it all back together, they'll just laugh in my face, right? And, and rightly so. And it's kind of the same in reverse for people like mechanics that are trying to figure out this whole wealth and finance stuff it's not that those guys aren't intelligent because they certainly are but you're just competing against like chess chess grandmaster level thinking the guys at goldman sachs and like all those big finance firms they're competing to take your money and (laughs) if you if you're not careful you'll lose it yeah i mean we sort of use the analogy you can do your own electrical work but you might end up as a black mess in the corner yeah. Or you might save money. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know which one you are, to be honest. You'll find out. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the the trends, um, excuse me, the trends from 21 and into 2022. What other being crypto in KiwiSaver funds? <laughs> Tell me, man. What do you think? Well, basically, the, the fund managers that I've seen that are using that approach, their objective is to, to have... Um, a portion of the portfolio that's similar to a commodity. So the objective of a commodity, you know, we know gold and silver is that it has a separate demand and supply chain from the traditional markets. So what they're attempting to do is have an exposure to something that's outside the traditional norm, because there are concerns like the US has printed 40% of all the money ever made in the last year. Yeah. Um, and crazy, just, crazy, eh? Uh, it's, <laughs> it's nuts. Um, but they tell you never to bid against the US dollar, but it, it's just it's just a means to own a certain portion outside the traditional market so you can capture the upside, but not to the point where you're putting yourself at jeopardy of losing your money. So I think it might work out for them, but it's like the internet bubble of 2000, 2003. Everyone's like, anything with .com is going to make me all this money, and it did until it didn't, and 1% survived and 99% failed. One of the 1% was Amazon. It's just who's that going to be? So it's really just having a small allocation to capture the upside and hopefully not get the negative. Yeah, I would suppose a lot of people are familiar with what crypto is, but they don't feel like they can get into it themselves. So if you buy a fund that has exposure to crypto, then you're kind of outsourcing that and you don't have to worry about the storage, the buying, the selling, the choosing the right funds. You're saying, hey, look, these are smart people. I'll let them make those decisions. I just want a little bit of exposure. If I've got a hundred grand, I know they've got 3% of crypto. So I'm getting some exposure there. Yeah. I mean, the, the two biggest benefits is one protection from theft um, because, you know, I've heard enough of those stories, you know, we can't remember your password and you lost millions of dollars. Um, and then the other side is, is, is encompassing them in a fund, you know, like it, Sure, you know, you could put all your money in crypto and you can be the next New Zealand billionaire of crypto, but you know, you're you're putting all your money in a particular industry and that industry might not pay off. So mm. the best thing about it is that it's encompassed in a diversified portfolio. That's that would say the biggest benefit of using like a provider to do it. Yeah. So any other trends that you're liking the look of or scared of in the finance side of things for next year? Well, fucking the banking system needs to change, mate. You just got a binary Excel spreadsheets from 1920. Yeah. So I think I think a bit of you know a bit of the blockchain incorporated in the finance system is not going to be a bad thing. Um, yeah. And and then the other side is you know from a business standpoint, non fungible tokens. Um, fungible just means it's um, it can be reproduced. So it's just saying it can't be reproduced in this intellectual property. I think the technology and the decent 
decentralized nature of digital assets from a business standpoint not necessarily a speculative investment side of things is something i'm considering and i think a lot of people out there that are in that position should be thinking themselves yeah yeah and it's if you go back before the internet was a thing if you're one of the first in your industry to get a website then you can own that market and you know you see people in new zealand with domains that like a generic domain like one that comes to mind is albany toyota their domain is albany i think something like that it's something real generic like you can own a space if you get in first and mm. i would imagine it's the same with nfts it's relatively low cost to learn and to experiment uh, the upside being quite big if it does become a thing <laughs> Yeah, I, my, the other trend that I'm concerned about is the old sharesies and hatch out there. It's just how minimal friction there is between um, a be person being able to make a decision on a, an investment and being able to close it mm -hmm. and how they actually make their money from the transactional aspects of that trade. So they try and incentivize that. So then you've got all these direct to consumers, the market that haven't quite experienced any sort of, you know, recorrection apart from when markets went down 20, 30% for a short period of time during COVID. Mm -hmm. But like it could go down for three to four years and you put all your money in the speculative bit. Maybe you invested in Blockbuster and it was a great call until Blockbuster was obsolete. Yeah. Um, so that's the concern for me is just people just looking at passive, thinking they can handle lose, potentially losing 50% of their money and then also having the ability to exit immediately is going to be, you know, lemmings off a cliff. Yeah, I would imagine there's a lot of people... Um, hourly trading on shares yeah. checking their phone and their shares on while they're on the toilet and things like that so it's kind of like the new the new internet fad uh, now I saw just doing my own homework it's not data I'd want to be quoted on but I looked at the S&P 500 during that 2008 crash period and from memory it took like 11 or maybe even 13 years for it to get back to where it was and it just no, it just appeared to me that from that high, if, if, if I said to you today, hey, it's going to be 13 years from tomorrow's crash that you're going to get back to where you are today, like how painful do you think that's going to be? And I would, you know, yeah. it's going to be very, very, very painful. You know, for even people that have five grand in sharesies or hatch or whatever, because that is their seed of financial freedom. And that if they become discouraged because of a bad event, then they might not think about it for another 20 years. Well, that's one of the, the unsung heroes of actually an investment strategy is flexibility. Like even irrespective of, I don't know, yeah, 11, 13 years sounds like a long time. I'm not sure we pulled, I would think in more three to four, but maybe, maybe you're talking about peak of the market to get back to peak. Yeah, I'm not sure, but it could be a long time, um, as you say, before you get it, but another thing is like your your circumstances it makes sense to have an investment strategy with a time horizon of 12 years mm. which is what you do with an S&P 500 but you're you don't know what's going to happen with your life and if you you're in a single asset class you're just riding that storm and you can't access any portion of it without crystallizing a loss um so that's another thing is i think the unsung hero is flexibility yeah and i think holding most people back that are not sort of homeowners yet is that they don't they don't feel like they've got anything to invest i'm guessing so there's kind of two options there is you can increase your kiwi saver contributions and that kind of just all ha happens automatically the downside of that is it's hard to get that money back <laughs> well you can't unless you really need it and hardship and i suppose the second option is to increase contributions but not directly to your kiwi saver so to another fund or through to other investments like what where do you guys start for people that don't own property um that are potentially they don't have much to invest yeah so i, I think um where a lot of people come unstuck with their kiwi saver is being over optimistic about the market so the first thing with kiwi saver is recognizing when you want to buy this house and if it's five to seven years it needs to be in a balanced portfolio not a growth People think, oh, yeah, I'll put it in growth, I'll get more returns. But as you say, if the market tanks for a period of time, they're stuck. Um, and then the other side of things is um, a com combination of a managed fund and KiwiSaver. They're the same thing. It's based on the same principles, except KiwiSaver is inaccessible. So what we normally recommend for clients that have at least a five-year time horizon 
you could do three to five, but anything less than three, you can't. Um, but let's say they want to buy a house in five to seven years. They don't have enough of a deposit. So they put the minimum contribution in the KiwiSaver to maximize the employer benefit. If they're self-employed, you're putting in 1043 a year to maximize the government contribution. Yeah. And then the money you have spare goes into a balanced portfolio that replicates what KiwiSaver does, which is you know, the structure of a custodial trustee. So if the provider goes under, the legal owner of the money is the custodial trustee that comes back to the individual. So that's protected in that sense. And then it's diversified across um, shares, property, bonds, and cash. And then you combine those in conjunction together. Then you've got your compounding returns. And as you approach the deadline when you're going to purchase the property, you would go as conservative as you can manage so that you don't want volatility. And then you consolidate it and use that towards your first home. There's also first home partner. Have you heard of that? That's out the gate. Oh, tell me more. First, it's a new thing. Like last month, the, um, the government introduced the $100 million property fund. Yeah. And you can get up to two hundred thousand dollars as a deposit from them, um, and they will be part owners of the property. Yeah, it's like a twenty-year payback period or something, right? Yeah, fifteen ideally pushed out to twenty, and if um, and it's based on the valuation of the property, and they're hoping that it, there'll be an appreciation of the growth. But I'm wondering if you could just like do an electronic valuation when the market appears to be down, but um. Yeah. But I, yeah, I wouldn't want to work with the government. And then you got to check in with them to make sure you're paying and you're budgeting. And like, this sounds like a, a nightmare, but that's another option too. Yeah, I mean, it's either going to be tremendously successful when you're giving away free money or it's going to be an incredible flop. And <laughs> there's been plenty of those programs released uh, by, you know, doesn't matter which party, by either government. Um, it's, it's government interfering in the private uh, sector again. Um, no, I like what, as well. Yeah, I like what Simplicity did do with uh, the first home buyer mortgage offer with the lower rates. But having said that, it was only for twenty percent deposit, um, so it's kind of missing a lot of a lot of the market. Now, I for I think for a lot of people that are trying to break in to property, you just got to buy wherever you can, when you can. In my opinion, you know, if you need a move to Hawke's Bay or um, Rotorua or whatever to buy something a bit cheaper and you know if you can work from home for a period of time you don't have to stay there forever you can rent it out and you know it's it's not not realistic for everyone but just getting on that property ladder as soon as possible does make a difference in the long run yeah it's the same with us it's like it's not timing the market it's about your personal circumstances like if you're if, it, if you want to buy a first home, it's a lifestyle choice. And at the point where you can afford it, service the debt, and also you want to have that as part of your life, then that's the time. Same with rental property, except it's a business and you want to be passionate about it because, you know, if you're not passionate about it, it the times have changed somewhat, you know, it's a bit more challenging to get rid of tenants, you know, yes. offset your cost of interest <laughs> deductibility. Like you're not going to, and you're stuck in there for 10 years before you sell it. Like the, it's the time to be a passionate business owner i think to get through it but and and that's just a a, a choice a personal choice a side hustle might make a lot more sense than buying an investment property at the moment um investment property you know six twelve months ago everything was cash flow positive because of the rates and the prices now because of the rates and the prices a lot of properties are not cash flow positive and you know you take away deductions and you know it does make it a lot harder and it makes it more of a elite sport for people that can afford a loss <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah it's 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 tough so you know definitely for us trends that we're looking at is if people have home equity and they traditionally would have bought another property now how do they take advantage of the equity and spare cash they've got if they're not going to buy a property what can they do they can do business investing they can pay down their own mortgage and they can look into you know funds like what, what we're talking about or you know hopefully not just chuck 100 grand in shares these in day trade because uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. it could become 50 grand overnight it could yeah it could. so what are you what are you following who, who are you following locally that you like uh, subscriptions or blogs or podcasts uh, you can do your own plug that's that's totally fine <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, just listen to mine all the time. No, no, no. Don't worry about that. I'm sure if they want to find it, they'll find a way. Yeah. Um, so Opus Partners, the Property Academy, I mean, I don't necessarily agree with the underlying approach and how they service clients, but I do agree with the information they provide. Yeah, it's so high quality. They pump it out. It's impressive. Um, there's Darcy, a mutual yeah. acquaintance, uh, NZ Everyday Investor. He's good. He likes the old Bitcoin a bit much, but, you know, he's, he's <laughs> like a, he speaks and explains it well. Um, she's on the money. It was also from Kuna Wealth. Um, yeah. And there's, uh, there's fuck, as much as I dislike the lady, Mary Holm does, um, she says 90% of good advice, 10% of what are you thinking? Yeah. So if you manage that, she's good too. Um, and a lot of yeah, what I learned, she a, she's got that podcast as well, right? Yeah, it's on um, Radio New Zealand. But if you look up Mary Holm, she's got like um, all her Q and A's from like the last few years, and then it'll have information when she's on Radio New Zealand. It's usually like monthly. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering how, who else is in the space that does a good. I mean, Core Logic. If you know, you want to know the information, but you also want to be put to sleep at the same time. Yeah. Do you? Um, uh, do you follow Chris Lee's newsletter? Uh, he's got yeah. Chris Lee and Partners. I think it's like a wealth management firm down in Nelson, Timaru, somewhere. I can't can't remember now, but he wrote a really good book, uh, Billion Dollar Bonfire, and that's how I found his newsletter. And you no, know, they manage. I think they manage a billion dollars for their clients, but more. Uh, so they you know his newsletters are quite good. I find. Is he is he local? Yeah, yeah, down, Chris down, Lee down the line mate if it's if it's not auckland you know <laughs> i'm gonna get a few dis dislikes for that but um they, they do have clients all around the country and they've been really? going they've been going for like 30 plus years how do you know the company sorry this is ruining everyone else's time i'll find uh, out later chris, I, I chris lee, lee and partners or chris lee and partners it's it's a good subscribe um whenever there's new uh, investment opportunities in the market that no, you get to find out about it like i'm not i'm not a guy that's subscribing to like when auckland council does like a hundred mil raise kind of thing like if you want to find out about all of those opportunities that's a good place to start as well but it's just like the political and social commentary and understanding like the macro side of things is good insights so what do you think how, how is your investment tactics or philosophies being impacted by the last you know, 18 months how do you think it's going to change what you might do in the next 10 years uh well the main change is best being mindful that bonds could increase in price and that could impact our retirement clients and just making sure the provider we use is being mindful of that um and i'm comfortable with it um and our, our investment philosophy hasn't changed in three decades um but you know greg i work with he's done it 33 years i've been alive 30 years but <laughs> um the same concept you know it's um liquidity L liquidity think of it kind of like if there's a burning house and there's only one door you know some people are going to get fucked yeah so you always got to make sure whatever you own um has a market for it and there's a, a means of exiting um the other piece is diversification you know don't have all your eggs in one basket same thing with um marketing you know you don't want to just rely on one channel two, two burning houses two burning houses yeah so at least you know you got more time you might be able to save some stuff from one house or the other one's stuff yeah um the tax efficiency is another key component and flexibility if you don't have an investment strategy that can adapt to the uncertainty of life you know it's tough so nothing's really changed um yeah yeah when i was talking to uh dean he was mentioning the importance of the tax efficiency side of things and becoming more and more important so if you're investing now and you haven't had tax and accounting and legal advice in the last couple of years, it's probably worth getting in touch with your people <laughs> and potentially getting some new people to help you out. If, if you do have some people helping you out and they haven't really been in touch, <laughs> so I would imagine there's a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's you know, like, why would you want to pay more tax than you need to, especially with the personal tax rate up to 39% if you're balling? Um, you know, there's there's two ways you save taxes. Either you know you own the un underlying individual equities instead of as a basket of goods, and that's how Kerner Wealth gets around it. 
But the other thing that's quite common is what's called a portfolio investment entity, which is the same as KiwiSaver. The yep. way it's structured, the way it's set up, the cap rate of tax is 28%. So it, even if you're, um, oh yeah, that's good. I'm glad that showed up. I don't know why. <laughs> so, you know, you got to roll with life. Um, but then the good thing is it's only capped at 28%. Um, and then with that, I'm still here, don't worry. With that, then, you know, you're, you're saving money because in New Zealand, there's no capital gains tax. So it's actually really on um, the income and there's very little income that are in those portfolios. And that's something that you can be mindful of with that. Yeah, yeah. I would imagine higher tax rates coming and stuff might get backdated. So good to get uh, everything sorted early in the new year if it's not already. <laughs> and uh, capital gains tax, I would say is not too far away if... Uh, especially if there's no change <clears throat> at next election. So interesting times if you do want to make money um, because they got to tax the people that do make money because a lot of people don't want to get out there. They want to sit on the couch and uh, that's that's their choice. Uh, so um, TikTok, where's the best place to find you, man? Oh, I'm everywhere, wherever you enjoy it the most. So if you just search Ryan J. Melton, I put the J because there's a lot of Ryan Melton. Um, there's also, if you want to read a book that I wrote for free, it's, um, it's called The Dirty Secrets of the Financial Elite. And it's actually in the podcast, NZ Guide to Financial Freedom. So you just search that up, look for the episode one of the book, and then I'll read it out. But yeah, everywhere, just search my name and hopefully I turn up or I've failed you. <laughs> Cool, man. Appreciate you uh, adding your two cents to these things. Cheers, mate.